So we are in Matthew chapter six. And so uh, this is verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So obviously this week we are in Jesus said, don't worry. And uh, we're gonna hear from the staff here in just a minute about that. But I wanna encourage you guys that this is a topic that we've been working on as a staff for a week. And I found myself even this morning waking up worrying because we're leaving on a trip for Florida this afternoon. And I caught myself worrying about the trip and about everything we have planned and had to remind myself of everything that Pastor Rick's gonna talk to you guys about today. And it works. It's one of those things where I realized, again, I was allowing worry to get in the way of what God wanted for me. Hey, Capital City Church, it's Pastor Rick, and I am here with Brandon and Brian. And I'm excited to be continuing our series this morning on Jesus Said Don't. The very first week, we talked about the fact that Jesus let the disciples know and everyone else that you don't have to become Jewish to become a Christian, which is good news for us because at least the three of us were not Jewish, we're Gentiles. The second week, we talked about don't be afraid. Now, fear is something that all of us struggle with from time to time. And as you remember, we focused on the fear of death. Jesus was talking about how we don't have to fear the afterlife, that in Christ, our afterlife is secured. And so today, as we kind of round the corner, uh, doubling back on the idea of fear, we're going to be dealing specifically with a part of fear, which is worry. Not so much being concerned about the afterlife, but being concerned about the tomorrow life or what's going to happen next. Worry oftentimes is borrowing tomorrow's trouble and making tomorrow's trouble today's trouble. And as we know, God gives us the grace that we need for tomorrow when we get there. And he gives us the grace that we need for today while we're here. Now, what we get for tomorrow is the faith that when we get to tomorrow, God's strength and his grace will be there. So, Brandon, are you a worrier? Overall, I would say I'm not predispositioned to worry, uh, but I do have times where I begin to worry more. Uh, a lot of those times come when things in my life, whether it's my calendar, whether it's at work, whether it's things at home, when they start to stack up, I want to just get them off the list. I want to take them away. And uh, then I start losing details or I start worrying that I'm going to miss out on the details. Um, and then that worry, it just compounds on top of itself. Uh, where then I'm worried about uh, this event or this a meeting going well. I start to worry about how I'm being perceived. I start to worry about my relationships with my wife and with my kids at home. I start to worry. It's just worry on top of worry on top of worry. It kind of starts to snowball, it seems. So Brandon, is your wife, Emily, a worrier? Uh, I think Careful. we I think we could both agree that she she carries the weight of the worrying in our house. My wife's a worrier too. She's a, she's good at it. Yeah. Yeah. What is what does she worry about? What kind of things does Emily worry about? I think there are a lot that uh, a lot of moms and stay at home moms would be worrying about things uh, taking care of the boys and uh, I mean those are our our primary disciples, our primary mission field that God's given us. Um, and then uh, of course the things around the house. Um, she worries about what I'm eating for breakfast, lunch, and supper more than I do. Uh, I usually get a text about every day, what did you take to lunch with you? <laughs> and it's a hard text to respond to because a lot of times it's not anything that I should be eating. Yeah, you don't want to tell her the truth. Yep. How about you, Brian? Are you a worrier by nature? I would say I've gone through seasons of uh, being a worrier, absolutely. Um, I've obviously always worried about um, fatherly things like worrying about, you know, are my kids safe? Are they, are, am I being a good parent? Um, I worry about things like that. Um, 
On the professional side, of, of course, there's little things that you worry about, like, is my voice going to hold out for a, a Sunday service or a performance? Um, is uh, my guitar string going to break? Is um, little things like that. I think I do. As a woman, I think we're constantly thinking, of, you know, there's the thing about women have so many things on their plate and they're thinking about so many things and men think about one thing at a time. So yeah. I think it is fair to say that women probably on average worry more than men. What do you worry about? Oh, well, a plethora of things. I, as a, an adult woman now, I worry about my, um, my adult children mm -hmm. and my grandchildren and the state of the world that that uh, they're going to grow up in, to be really honest, and um, the state of salvation for people I love are big ones for me. When you and I were talking about that originally, um, it brought up the thought, before the divorce, I was super optimistic. I don't think I really feared anything in the future until that season of my life, and because that was such a dark season in a place, Iowa, that we're not from. Um, Sometimes the enemy leverages that. So this has been going on 11, 12 years since then. But those will come up like, I wonder if this season's gonna happen again, or I wonder if, depending on situations, because that season was financially hard, emotionally hard, physically hard, um, all aspects of hard, psychologically hard. Yeah. And um, so sometimes the enemy does leverage that where I have to catch myself drifting into fear or worry. And um, I just have to capture that and say, I'm not going there, I know it's not. I look right. back on his faithfulness, but I literally have to go back and almost sort of quantify. No, no, no. Look, that was a season and everything worked out. Yeah. God more than met, blessed all those needs. So I go back to fact versus an assumption, which is we talk about as a made up story in my head. So Kathy, is it true? Are you a worrier? I am. Yeah. What, are, what are the kind of things you worry about? Um, I worry about my kids. I worry about my grandkids. I worry about my uh, parents and um, as they're aging. Yeah, I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. I've got two boys, as you know, and I spend a lot of time worrying about them as well. Um, Jared, now you've said you don't worry, but I think you do. I think you just think it's due diligence. But uh, you told us a story the other day about a boat ride with a certain worship leader. You want to share that story about worry? Right. So I don't think it's, again, I, I'd like to convince myself it's not worry. Could that be denial, Jared? It could be. It could be. It's a possibility. <laughs> it's, it's out there. But uh, yeah, Brian, we were up at on um, vacation and Brian and his family happened to be up there and he offered to come by and pick us up in their boat. And so we hopped in the boat, put a life jack on Enoch and we're cruising across the lake. And I realized I got in a boat that I've never been under or walked around. I don't know when the last time the engine was serviced. I don't know what grade of fuel he put into it. I don't know if the oil had been changed. I, I, I'd never actually ridden with Brian in any kind of vehicle. He can play the guitar, but can he drive? Yeah, I, yeah, I, had no idea. So I found myself in this entire thing going, I made a terrible choice. Why did I get into this with my son? Yeah. Because again, in my own, I know the maintenance of my own vehicles. I know how I drive. I even I put Enoch in your Jeep one day to drive across the parking lot because I trust how you drive and what you're going to do and how you take care of your Jeep. And so I know all of those things and I feel like that I can control all those things. And so I don't need to worry about those things when they're in my control. But would you say you worry more than Crystal or Crystal worries a little more than you? Um, I would say, again, Crystal worries way more than I do, um, especially when we're talking about the kids and the things that we worry or, you know, that would traditionally worry you about the kids. Uh, she'll bring up stuff. She'll talk about things. She'll ask me questions that I go, I didn't even realize that this was a thought process. Like, I didn't know that this was something that we could be thinking about. We laugh that dad's the fun parent and mom's the serious parent, right? <laughs> All right now. And so, but... <laughs> So as, as we're learning today, worry is taking tomorrow's troubles or issues, even if they're real things, and dealing with them as like we're dealing with them right now. When we, we can't, right? We can't deal with things that are off in the distance or off in the future in the present moment. And worry robs us of being able to be in the present. Some of my favorite moments are when I'm present with people and I find myself not trying to think about what's going to happen right. in the next hour or the next week or the next year. Um, you have a couple of cats, don't you? Kathy, I do. You I have do. two. They're named Birdie and, and Bogey. Bogey. Uh huh. And um, you like your cats pretty well. I do. And we've discussed. I'm not really a cat person. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate them from a distance. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I like the pictures of your cats. Yeah. But you know, the the Bible in Matthew six, Jesus talks about um, animals. He talks about birds, and he talks about um, even flowers, and, and how God takes care of them. And I think one of the reasons that he brings up animals is because animals don't have the ability to worry about the right. future. So your cats are pretty content, right? They are. But do you get the impression that they're thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow? 
N no. What mainly do you think your cats think about? When they're going to get fed next. <laughs> when they're going to get fed next, yeah. Or who's going to scratch them right, or whatever. Right. They've got a pretty good life. So we're going to talk today about one of the most simple messages we could possibly talk about. And Jesus was abundantly clear in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, as Pastor Jared had just read, that we don't have to worry, yet we choose sometimes to worry. And we talked about fear two weeks ago or several weeks ago, and mostly focused on the fear of death, but worry is more about the fear of life, about what's going to happen next. So let's define worry and um, let's just kind of get into it. I think you're going to really enjoy today. It is super simple, as I mentioned, with just two clear application points based on one really clear passage of scripture from Jesus' sermon in Matthew chapter six. Worry is a sense of uneasiness and anxiety about the future. Scripture tells us that anxiety about the future is ultimately grounded in a lack of understanding or a lack of trust in God and God's promises. That worry is something we struggle with because we don't fully understand or trust God. Now, how many of you are worriers by disposition? How many of you just are a worrier, okay? Now, how many of you don't really worry by disposition, but you only worry when something big pops up in your life and you got something you're going to face? I mean, that would be the rest of us, right? Because if you just don't think about anything, um, I've, I've never met anybody like that. We should talk afterwards if you can just turn your brain off and not even think. I mean, obviously, we were, we're, we're concerned. We worry. Things blow up and they get out of control. They're bigger than we are. All of us from time to time, we struggle with this. So if you're a worrier, even now in this present moment, perhaps worried about something, or you're one of those who every once in a while gets sort of overwhelmed with life and begin to worry, I want you to take these two principles today and I want you to apply them to your life because I promise you they work. They work not because I made them up. They work because Jesus made them up and Jesus communicated these principles that you're gonna hear the second half of my time that we spend talking about this passage he communicated these to people he loved about how simple and how peace-filled and how joyful this life should be. But we complicate it. And Jesus says we don't have to. In fact, he gives us instructions on how not to. Um, yesterday, I had a project that I dove into that was a little over my head. And I didn't think it was going to be over my head. My wife's out of town for four days, and that usually equals projects that are over my head. Because I like to plan the things that keep me busy. When joy goes for the first day or two, I'm super productive. I get all kinds of stuff done. I mean, I do weird things like deep clean the house, go clean the garage. I mean, I make sure everything's tip top shape. I wash all the clothes. I make sure everything, I, mean, I control everything I possibly can. Once I'm done with that, I sit back and I have nothing else to do. So I want other things to do. So I was going to change the brakes excuse me, on Joy's car. Now, that should be easy. Changing front brakes um, on a car is something that my dad taught me how to do when I was 14. And I've been doing it for years. I've changed dozens of front brakes. I don't always do rear brakes if they're not disc brakes, but front brakes I can handle. And Joy's car is an older British car and um, is, uh, was affordable to buy, but not affordable to work on. So when the brake pads needed to be changed, I decided I was gonna do it. How hard could it be? And so yesterday morning, I went out to the garage jacked the car up, pulled the wheel off, began to look at these brakes. They looked a little different than I'd ever seen before. And so I did what you would do. I consulted YouTube. Now, YouTube, unfortunately, only had one video on all of the internet, one instruction video on how to change the front brake pads on this particular vehicle. And so I watched it. Now, I know you might ask me why I would trust my Saturday to a guy trying to film a video of him changing brake pads with a camera in one hand and a beer in the other um, on a Saturday, but it was all I had. And I watched him do it, and I did exactly what he did to the letter. And I blew the video up so I could see which bolts he was removing. I paid attention. And about two hours later, I was still trying to take the caliper off the rotor. And if you don't know what that means, I act like I know what that means. I wasn't done. How about that? I wasn't even started. And so I hear this Corvette motor coming up the alley in Prairie Trail way too fast. My HOA, Prairie Trail, would have definitely reported him. Here comes Pastor Dan on a Saturday. Pulls into the driveway. He's like, hey, I just wanted to see what's up. And I said, well, I'm glad you're here. You're a great mechanic. I'm changing my front brake pads. I need your help. He made fun of me. Who needs help changing front brake pads? And I said, take a look at it. 
he in fact needed help as well. So he consulted the video and we were watching and we did everything. We went back through the steps. Finally, I'm just sheer force, just yanking on it, worried that I'm gonna pull the car off the jack stands. And then we hear another vehicle come up, different sound, different vehicle. It was my friend Sean right here uh, in his diesel truck. And he comes pulling up and he says, what are you guys doing? And I said, well, we're trying to change the brake pads. And Sean said, you guys need help. If it takes two people to change brake pads and you've been working on it for three hours, something's wrong with you. He said, let me take care of it. And so Sean looked at it and you know what? Sean got stumped as well. Now, not as stumped as us because Sean said, I never watch YouTube videos. I figure it out myself. He was kind of bragging, but we literally went back through all of us, watched the video again, could not figure it out. And so finally we realized the video was wrong, that there were two bolts that the man in the video with the beer and the cell phone didn't remove. And I trusted three hours of my life following the instructions exactly, but they were exactly wrong. So when you follow the instructions and you follow them exactly, first of all, we need to know that they're exactly right and that we follow them exactly. And so Jesus at the beginning of this passage says, you don't have to worry about your life. And we say, Jesus, we need some instructions. And he gives it to us exactly in two simple points that I'm going to give to you after we sing some songs in just a minute and I come back up and we really dive into this passage. But there's five questions I want to ask to determine whether you're a worrier, how you feel about worry, just to prime the pump and get us started. The first one is who of us by worrying can add one single hour to our life, to our lives, to our children's lives, to our parents' lives? Who can add one single hour? Does that sound like Jesus in Matthew chapter six? Number two, who of us by worrying has taken a year off of our lives by what we do to ourselves while we worry? The state that we put ourselves in physically and emotionally, the things we may do to preoccupy our minds to keep us from worrying. Number three, who of us by worrying is driving people in your life crazy? out of your minds. We could probably have some testimony now. And we're not going to. I tried to stir it up with the staff a little bit when we did our interviews, but they were pretty good. They knew their spouses would be watching. (laughs) Who of us by worrying has upgraded our wardrobe or reduced our grocery bill? Who of us by worrying has added value to what we value most? Jesus says you don't have to worry about your life. We know in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. But sometimes we say trust in worry with all of our heart. Don't lean on our own understanding and all our situations of worry is going to direct our paths and show us where we need to go. And we know that even sounds ridiculous to say that, but yet sometimes we do it. Instinctively, intuitively, spiritually, we know that worry is not the right choice. So my question to you is, why worry? I'm gonna pray for you and then we're gonna sing. And we're gonna sing these songs to the Lord because he deserves these songs. They're things that we tell him that we believe are true and we're telling them to God about himself, it's worship. We're telling them to ourselves, these things about God. We're also telling them to each other, the people who are around us and we do it through singing. And the Bible tells us that God deserves it and that you and I were created to do this. And so whether we do it well or whether we do it with a a whole heart, not so well, we do it because it's right. It feels right. It's just the right thing for us to do. And as we are, while we're doing this, I've asked some friends to be part of our prayer team and they'll be up in the front on both sides here uh, of the sanctuary. And if you have any burden that you're bearing today, if you are feeling worried, if you're preoccupied with the future and you've brought the future tomorrow, next week, next month, next year into today that separated you from this present moment and your relationships with God and with others. If you have a burden you're bearing for somebody else, something going on in your life that you'd just like to share with somebody and have them pray with you and support you. These are people who I would ask and have asked to pray for me and they are are waiting to pray with you if you have anything that you'd like to share. So after the first side of the breaks were done and my supervision left, uh, Dan and 
and Sean, they said, we know you can handle the other side by yourself. And sure enough, the other side was completed in about 27 minutes and uh, all buttoned up and looked great. And you know what I thought? I thought I should make a video um, to show people how to do this because it's so simple when you have the right instructions. In a, in a sense, when Jesus gave this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, where he's talking about the birds of the air and the flowers of the field and all of them being adorned like Solomon and how they don't have to worry and how he's got their future, he's got their present and, and gives them all this hope. The disciples are like, man, you should make a video, Jesus. People have been giving us instructions for, for years, but they're incomplete. And this is so simple and yet so important. And Jesus unfolded it in a way that I don't want you to miss because it's so beautiful yet so simple, we're tempted to overlook it and say, what's next? Now, Jesus, first of all, as he was talking about the birds and talking about the flowers, was doing it on purpose. And I just wanna show you something that's really important here. Um, he says, well, I not clothe you or my father not clothe you much more or better than even these. And then he says to them, ye of little faith, because he gets the fact that faith and worry they go hand in hand and direct opposites. That worry and faith are not compatible partners. And, and so he says to them, ye of little faith. Now it's a word play, a compound word that is unusual in all of the Greek New Testament. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. The disciples, when they wrote the gospels as inspired by the Holy Spirit, they wrote them in Greek. And so it was an Aramaic phrase, two words compounded together that Matthew, who wrote the book of Matthew, according to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had never really heard before. And Jesus must have cracked the crowd up big time because it was something Matthew wanted to note. And this is what he said. Jesus was saying, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be preoccupied. You don't have to be obsessed. Don't bring tomorrow into today. I take care of the birds. I take care of the flowers. And he said, you little faithers, you little faithers, are you going to choose to trust worry? Are you going to choose to trust me and the disciples? And the crowd were saying, we can't watch birds, Jesus. That's only what retired people do. We got things to do. We got jobs. We got kids. We got bills. We have relationships. We have friendships. And so Jesus, he lays out the point, the simplicity found at the end of this great section of this simple sermon. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that you're worried about and a whole lot more will be given to you. And the word first is both chronological and it is priority. When Jesus says, seek first, listen up. Do it first and also do it with first priority. And the disciples are writing it down. Okay, we got it. Do it first and do it with first priority. What's that mean? And so Jesus, he explains it and he explained it both with his words and with his life. But the first concept is really simple. And this is the first of two things that I'm gonna give you that can be life-changing if you grab a hold of it and apply it. So simple, but don't miss it. If you can get ahead of worry in the morning, you'll stay ahead of worry all day long. If you can get in front of worry in the morning, first thing, you can stay ahead of worry all day long because the thoughts that you put in your head first thing are some of the most important thoughts that you're gonna think throughout the entire day. How you start your day matters so much and we see it demonstrated in Jesus' life over and over and over again. Now we have the benefit of the Old Testament. We certainly have the benefit of learning from the life of King David. And in Psalm chapter five, verse three, King David, he, he lays this, this thought, this prayer out and he says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and I wait expectantly. And you say, well, David was king. He had all the money you want. He had a wife, he had a bunch of wives, but we won't talk about that. He had land, he had cattle, he had horses, he had all, you know, everything. How could he possibly have any worries? This was written in a time, and you can read about it in 1 Samuel. It's one of the imprecatory Psalms where King David was praying that God would take care of his life and take care of him from his enemies. It was written at a time, along with a couple other psalms, where David was, yes, king, 
holed up in his palace, but his son Absalom had set up a tent only a few miles down the road from the palace and was intercepting people as they came to try to see the king for David to mediate and do his king things with the people who he loved. And Absalom said to them, my dad doesn't have time for you, I do. In a sense, I'm your king, I'll be your king. And David knew because his, his people were telling him, your son is coming for you. He wants to kill you. He wants to take your throne. And so sure enough, Absalom said just after a few years to all of the people who would listen, when you hear the sound of the trumpets, you proclaim me king. And he was gonna kill his own father. And so David himself vacated the palace, left the city, fled his son, collected the people who he cared about, who he didn't want to lose their lives. And just about everything that could go wrong in David's life was going wrong. Reasons to worry? Yep. And he says, in the morning, Lord, in the morning, first thing in the morning, you hear my voice, God. I lay my request before you and I wait with expectation because I know, this is important, I know that if I worry about your kingdom, you'll worry about mine. How do you start your mornings? We're gonna hear from the staff again, from our pastoral staff. And then I'm gonna come back and talk to you about one other quick principle that I think once we apply these two together, I know it can change our lives. I think it's true. Several years ago, I adopted just um, a habit, I'll call it, but a pattern. The minute my eyes open up, I just start talking to the Lord. And that has just been something that's just kind of calmed me down and, and helped know that I start my day out that way. And while I may have a day where I don't have just time to have a quiet time, there's a consistent conversation going on. And I think that does help me listen for His voice instead of the voice that could overwhelm me, which would be outside voices or even my own. Yeah, I, uh, I remember as a young man trying to figure out how do these great men start their day, right? Everyone, Christian or non-Christian, would state the same thing. Their morning was like how they started their day. The Navy SEALs talk about some of those kind of things and making their bed, some accomplishments. Um, I think it's 100% true. Spiritually, um, my mind can wander, whether it's the, the worry um, or my 30 page to-do list that I want to get done. Um, and I do, I start running a, a wrong route, a wrong path. Um, I mentioned, I think in the morning time, Lori knows this, like I'm a big worship guy. I figure if anything's gonna fill my head besides my time of prayer in Bible study, it's even the shower. Like I am going to be uh, busting out some of my Christian music. I want that in my head, I want that in my heart. Yeah. And it seems to help my perspective from the morning on. Even if I have to recalculate, you know, with the crazy phone call or an email that we have to address sometimes, it's just easier to recalculate, to renew my mind when I start that way. Cause um, probably like most of us guys, when we're goal oriented, man, I, I start down the wrong path. It's hard when I have to um, recorrect yeah. and I don't start it off in the appropriate way. I would say I do stay ahead of it better when I start in the morning that way, because it seems like I've kind of like worn the path back to that recalibration in the morning a little bit. It's it seems like there's less resistance to get back to that space to spend time, whether that's going back to prayer or scripture. Uh, sometimes even listening to some worship music can be something that's just quick enough um, and just enough of a nudge back to where I was that morning uh, in my in my time that I spent with God. Now you have three little boys and um, a lot of responsibility and the kids when they wake up in the morning, I would guess that most of uh, your ability to be proactive is sort of gone. You're sort of reactive at that point, right? Being a dad and taking care of them and feeding them. So what do you do in the morning to make absolutely sure that you're going to be able to get started the right way? And that, that's exactly it. Once, especially once those guys get up, uh, it is the day is not my own anymore. And so uh, I have to make sure I get up first. I got to get up before them and not half an hour before them. It has to be a little bit a, a amount of space before them. Uh, because inevitably that'll be the morning they get up early and uh, everything will end up going totally different than how I originally planned it. 
and then work on putting barriers around other distractions. They're not the only distraction at all in my life. Um, I have to get ready. I have to be intentional. I have to go straight, uh, straight to my time with Christ. Brian, you shared with us in staff meeting the other day that there was a time when you went through some weird physical things where you had something that uh, was wrong, but you weren't 100 percent sure what was wrong and it was concerning. And I resonate with um, with what you were saying, because um, I have a tendency sometimes to be uh, concerned or worried about stuff like that as well. You know, you talked about the frustration that you had about not being able to figure it out and how it was affecting you. And what strategy did you use to be able to just put that worry behind you so that you could stay in the moment during the day? You know, part of the worry was not knowing um, what what the issues were. Um, I felt like if I would have known what was wrong or got an answer, you know, when I was going getting tests done, that um, I felt like I would have been able to handle that worry a little bit better. But um, you worry about the unknown. And what I did every day, I was I was just thankful every day when I would wake up. <laughs> there was a, a time when it was a little scary for me, and I would just thank God every morning when I would wake up that I'm alive and breathing and still here on this earth to be with my family, to raise my, my kids. Luckily that season, um, I've, I've sort of passed through that season and my daily routine now is, um, it, it does include that. I have a different schedule than my wife. Um, so I'm not the one that wakes up with my kids cause I'm usually on the road late at night. And um, so when I wake up, nobody's, nobody's home usually. I typically go to my music room at my house and um, there's times when I, I start the day off with prayer. Um, sometimes I start the day off with um, um, working on worship songs or other songs that I'm working on um, that week. So it's, it's a great start to the day for me um, because I can get ahead of things. And I'm a, I'm a task list person. I make li- checklists and task lists and things like that. But ultimately, um, I'm just thankful every day when I wake up yeah. and, I and I start with that. Jared, I'll start with you. You know, we talked about this in our staff meeting on Tuesday, and we all discussed our morning routines. Um, you and I share a little bit of a similar uh, experience, but share your experience um, and, and your thought process. Yeah, so I ended up uh, after staff meeting just feeling like, wow, I'm a really bad Christian because everybody had like pretty solid morning routines, and I'm uh, getting up and heading to the restroom and then getting coffee are about the most consistent things in a routine if I were ever have it. But what I have found though, is that the mornings where I am more consistent, uh, Monday is my day off. And so Monday, I started off Monday and I had a list of things I wanted to do. Woke up and started on my list, halfway through the day, halfway through the list, just found myself like frustrated. Nothing was getting done, nothing was happening. And uh, it wasn't until uh, Crystal and I were heading to the gym I was able to kind of uh, refocus on like, oh, this is what it was. I started off the day kind of aiming for myself or maybe just my list or whatever and didn't have any clear kind of direction. As we were talking in staff meeting on Tuesday, that was what I kind of had said that like, you know what, today, um, I'm getting up the, the next day and I'm going to read as much of the, the Gospel of Mark as as possible. And then just realizing that it is about that. It's about that being intentional. Um, and so even though it doesn't necessarily fit perfectly in my personality, I have to put myself in that mindset. I have to make that effort, make that intentional step. So you started today, today being um, Wednesday when we're filming, Wednesday, yeah. uh, reading the Gospel of Mark and yeah. starting it off with um, just a, a moment for the Lord and, yes. and uh, dedicating your day. Uh, so how's it going so far? So far, so good, too early to tell. I, again, find myself, my, um, my focus being uh, uh, on what the the Lord would have for today. And that was where just walking through the day, I, I, I find that um, it's easier to have a, a reminder, a kind of a, a reset moment with that and, and keeping uh, scripture and that time with the Lord. And that intentionality is what it required for me and it requires it every single morning. Kathy, on the other hand, is pretty intentional with her mornings, right? You shared, you shared your routine with us and it was inspirational to me. Talk a little bit about the way you start the day with the Lord. From the moment I wake up, I'm um, thanking the Lord for the day, saying, good morning, Lord, thank you for this day. And um, just asking that he would guide my steps today. If there's anything that is really worrisome to me, I just offer that prayer up right away. And um, yeah, and from there, um, I start getting ready by listening to the Bible app, listen to scripture and um, until I'm out the door and then Christian music on the radio. So um, just try and keep that 
that sense of um, focus all day long. So that's kind of my pattern. Do you do it every single day, no matter what, or do you ever have days where you miss it? Um, every single day I do when I wake up. Mm -hmm. I do, I, um, in our bedroom, we have sliders that look out to the woods. And I have a certain tree that I always look at. Um, and I'll, good morning, Lord, thank you for this day. Yeah. The listening to the scripture, I hadn't done it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I had changed to listening to more of a podcast. Sure. And then I'm like, no, I, I need to get into the scripture. I, the yeah, I need to get in the word. I don't need to hear what someone else to, has to say about the word. I need to hear the word. So um, probably about a month ago, I started doing that again. It, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it really does. So as a reminder, Jesus doesn't say don't plan. He doesn't say don't prepare. Comparing us to the animals um, gives us a real advantage because it's what allows us to be able to become believers. We can prepare and think about tomorrow and our future. He just says, don't worry. So how do you start your day? Um, most of the time, I start my day pretty well. Sometimes I don't, but I have to choose. And I know that for me, particularly when I'm dealing with times of worry, the thoughts that I put here as soon as my eyes open are the most important thoughts I think all day. And so what I've learned is that I have two things on my nightstand that are important when I wake up. One is my cell phone on my wireless charger sitting right there so I can hear texts and answer my phone anytime. And the other is a Bible. And what I found is that a paper Bible is better than my cell phone because my paper Bible doesn't have notifications and my cell phone does. So if you're thinking of a morning routine, you're thinking of starting your morning off right, you may want to consider a paper Bible if you don't have one. We have some available in our city store or I can make good recommendations. I teach out of the NIV translations, not necessarily the best, it's just the most common. And I just encourage you to get up in the morning and read something that gets your mind started on the right foot. If mind can start with feet. I guess they can. Uh, if you don't know what to read, perhaps you'd want to read Matthew 6, 24 through 35, this very passage that I'm talking to you about today. I have to choose when I wake up. Do I want to grab my Bible or do I want to grab my cell phone? And my cell phone is where the world is waiting for me. And I don't mean the bad part of the world. It could be, but I just mean the rest of the world. It's where my notifications have piled up, where social media is crammed full, where my email inbox usually has some work there waiting for me, where my news app tells me the things that are going on in the world. And I have to decide how I want to inform my mind and how I want to start my day. So literally you choose. If you get ahead of worry in the morning, you can stay ahead of it all day long. First, seek ye first. Seek ye first in, in chronology of your day, but also in priority of your day. The second principle, very, very simple, demonstrated and modeled by Jesus over and over again. If you find yourself tempted to borrow from tomorrow, to worry, look for a way to participate in what God is doing today. Now you see what Jesus said, seek ye first, the kingdom of God, the things God cares about and a right relationship with him. And if you do that, if you seek them first with your day and your time, and also with your priority, all of the things you're looking for in first century, it was clothes and places to stay and things to eat. For us, it may be relationships and money and advancements, promotion, children. As we've said, there's just a myriad of things. But, but when you begin to bring in things that you can't control, when you become preoccupied with the future and you find your faith in God in conflict, with the reality that you live in, when you're tempted to borrow from tomorrow, look for a way to participate in what God do, is doing today. Now, you may think that sounds very preacherly, very, well, that's what the church staff do. And, and sure, it's what we're supposed to do, but it's what you're supposed to do. And, and it's very, very simple. And if you don't know what God is concerned about, it's usually not a what, it's usually a who. And it usually starts with the people closest to you. Perhaps it's the person you wake up next to. That's the person who you influence the most. If you're married or in a family relationship, your spouse, your kids, they're the ones who you wake up and you see. The ones who you see at the dinner table, the ones who you help get dressed perhaps with little kids and get on a school bus or drop them off, the ones who are in your inner circle. 
God is working in their lives and they're the ones who you have so much influence in or around. And when we become preoccupied with self, the very best weapon we have is to focus on somebody else and what better people to focus on than the ones God's trusted us with the most. And then it extends in concentric circles to perhaps the person you see when you walk into your office or your friends, the person you text. But more often than not, the things that God is concerned about aren't really things, they're people, but we look out there for the big things and we miss the real things that are closest to us. If you don't know how to do that, do you know anybody who's struggling? Anybody who has something going on in their lives? Any difficulty? Anybody with heartache? Remember to pray for them because that takes your mind away from yourself and puts it back where it belongs on the fact that God can do miracles in people's lives, that God does answer prayer, and that this life is not all about us. It's two very simple things. Seek first in chronology in the morning, the very first thing, and also seek as priority when we find ourselves slipping, bring ourselves back. There's two questions I wanna ask you. They're very simple questions as we wrap this up. What would happen if we believe that God is waiting on us tomorrow with every single thing that I need tomorrow. What if I really believed it, that when what I'm worried about comes, God's gonna be there, that he's got it under control and that he's going to give me exactly what I need when I need it. We worry because we want tomorrow's answers today. We want to know what's gonna happen and control what's gonna happen. And God says, I give you grace to deal with today, today, and faith to know that when tomorrow comes, I'll give you all the grace you need. But if you live in tomorrow's world, you're living in a world without that grace that God has given you to handle it. So it causes anxiety and causes worry. So what if you really believed that God was faithful and that he was gonna meet you there and as you seek first his kingdom and a right relationship with him, all of these things that we're worried about will be taken care of. Because Jesus says, if you worry about my kingdom, I'll worry about yours. What if we believed it? Number two, why not believe it? Some say it's absurd. Some say, I'm not sure it'll work. Some say, well, God did it last time, but I don't know if he'll do it this time. And so it leads us to a, a diverging trail. Do I trust God or do I trust worry? Trust and worry with all my heart. Don't lean on my own understanding and all my ways acknowledge worry and worry will direct my path. How absurd is that? Trust the Lord with all my heart. Lean not on my own understanding and all my ways I'll acknowledge him and he will direct my path. Well, Jesus had to remind his disciples from time to time that this was gonna be a theme that they had to deal with. And in the book of John, as we close, I just wanna leave you with some parting words of Jesus. This is in John 14, at the beginning and toward the end of this chapter, where Jesus was talking to his disciples about a life without him presently in his physical body, and the disciples were freaked out. Jesus had said, I'm gonna die. He told them he was gonna come back. But man, he was explaining to them things that were just mind blowing. And they were trying to believe, but they were having a hard time and they'd left everything behind to follow Jesus. And Jesus leaves them with this promise again, reminding them of this Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 34 or 24 through 35. In John 14, one, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them. But if you don't do something, they will be. Seek first. Don't let, be proactive. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, not in worry. Believe also in me. And then down toward the end, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Who, who doesn't want that? Does anyone not want God's peace? the kind of peace that passes all human understanding, the kind of peace that stands guard over our hearts in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, 
Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give it to you as the world gives. I give you what's real. Don't let your hearts be troubled and choose not to be afraid. If you get ahead of worry in the morning, you can stay ahead of it all day long. When you find yourself bringing tomorrow's troubles into today, choose to focus on something that God is doing in this, your world now and retrain the way you think. Father, thank you for my friends. And I thank you for the simple words of Jesus, for something as simple as just the phrase, seek first the kingdom. And as we break that down and look at what that means, it seems so out of reach for some, but yet you tell us that not only can we, that we should, but you also tell us it's a choice that we make. The choice is simple as what we do when we first wake up in the morning. Do we wake up and we tell you, God, I trust you. Let today be your day. Use me as how you want to use me. Do we crack open your word and maybe put some of that in our own hearts so that we start the day off declaring our faith and our trust in you? Are we willing to when we slip, when we fall, to allow ourselves to leave our selfish preoccupation and focus and look at the world around us to see what you're doing, to see who you're doing it in, that we're faithful with those closest to us, nudging them toward a deeper relationship with you and showing them your love. I pray this miracle that you have promised that you'll do in us, that you would do it, that we would experience it, that we would live in your peace. We don't live in a very peaceful time. We live in a world full of worry and there's a lot to worry about if we lose sight of who you are and how you are and what you do. So let us be steadfast in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.